Hi everyone, welcome uh, for the to the first uh, uh, Magnet Talk of the year. Welcome from the team. Um, we want to um, thanks really a lot all past uh, speakers and participants. We started in 2020 and we had a really great uh, uh, turnover on a variety in career stage, in gender geography. We have a YouTube channel. I wanted to put some numbers because we always look for new speakers and we want to encourage people for early career stages as well um, and more geographic distribution. This is what we need and we have a good, uh, uh, a good amount of speakers lined up for the year. Um, but um, so let me remind you about the format. It's typically 25 minutes presentation where we ask you to keep your microphone muted. After that, we're going to have a 10 to 15 minutes for questions. You can tell, you can write your questions in the chat or, or you can raise your hand. And at the end, if you're interested, there's going to be a time for catch up uh, after the recording. So today I'm really happy to introduce uh, you Aldo Winkler from uh, INGV in Italy. Uh, he's going to be talking about the uh, magnetism of leads and lichens of monitoring, um, uh, mitigating the impact of particulate matter on cultural heritage. Uh, so please, uh, Aldo, take uh, the floor is yours. Okay, let's start. Uh, first of all, sorry for the uh, last, uh, I think two weeks ago, uh, I had a bad cold, but I'm so glad to see you here. And uh, for me, this is such a pleasure to introduce this work and to show some really fantastic places. So I hope you will enjoy the pictures, uh, at least, uh, we, where we applied magnetic biomonitoring uh, methodologies. and. Uh, I can also tell that uh, the most exciting part of this work was to really co uh, cooperate uh, with a lot of different scientists. Uh, you can see from the color codes uh, that there are involved uh, different authors uh, ranging from paleomagnetists uh, to cultural heritage operators, uh, life scientists uh, and chemists. And uh, I will give you just a really short introduction on the main methods involved uh, uh, they will be probably very simple for who is very practical with them, uh, but uh, I think they can be useful for people uh, watching to this uh, recording. Um, the application of rock magnetism uh, to the biomonitoring of uh, airborne particulate matter uh, started um, about 20 years ago in a project that was called Magnet, and uh, this idea was by Barbara Meyer, and the basic, very basic principle was that uh, an uncontaminated biological media, usually leaves, uh, should be uh, diamagnetic um, and then switches to ferromagnetism uh, due to the bioaccumulation of iron oxides uh, that are usually emitted by anthropic um, activities, uh, usually by cars uh, in urban context. But my specific and personal uh, step forward was the use of lichen transplants um, and uh, it was conceived uh, together with Stefano Loppi which is uh, a life scientist uh, from the University of Siena. Uh, lichens can be sampled from pristine areas uh, and then we can compare their natural original magnetic and chemical properties uh, to those after being exposed uh, for usually about three months. So they work, uh, I can say, as a kind of missing leap uh, between a leaf and an air filter. This is a, the very basic workflow of this kind of uh, methodology. You can see on, uh, on the left the typical diamagnetic or at least the paramagnetic properties of the samples uh, when they are clean. Then, uh, when they are, let's say, dirty, uh, the prevailing ferrimagnetism that uh, results from the accumulation of iron oxides. Uh, I mainly use uh, two kind of different measurements that are um, still magnetic susceptibility because it is the fastest and most uh, sensitive proxy of the concentration of magnetic minerals. But I also use um, hysteresis loops, uh, forks, because they are good for uh, understanding the grain size, the magnetic mineralogy, and uh, all the 
parameters that are both dependent and undependent of the concentration of magnetic minerals. I finish this kind of very short summary with this slide. These are two different periods of these studies. On the left, you can notice a typical early study. I can tell you about 20 years ago, maybe 17 where it was already clear that magnetic uh, biomonitoring is very effective for determining, uh, uh, I use a pointer, uh, for determining uh, the concentration of iron oxides um, at a very good uh, spatial resolution. That is not possible, of course, uh, with air filters. And uh, here you can see that uh, uh, the maximum value is here near the traffic light and as we move away from the road, the, the uh, magnetic susceptibility decreases in this uh, red to green scale. Here on the right, there is a very important application of the use of lichens. And um, here it was dem demonstrated, uh, this was a key point, and it was also demonstrated by other way, magnetic, always uh, according to magnetic methodologies by, for example, Barbara Meyer, that uh, in traffic and in basi urban context, uh, most of the metallic particles are emitted by brakes and not by combustion. Uh, here you can see all these red dots uh, are lichens uh, and they are uh, so uh, near, they are behind uh, to the so-called end members in this case of brakes emissions, uh, while here are the usual uh, and members that are due to exhaust emissions from different kind of fuels. And now I start with the uh, very uh, main part of this, um, of this talk. And uh, particulate matter uh, uh, is, of course, not only dangerous for Earth. Of, of course, it's dangerous itself for our urban context and especially for cultural heritage because it uh, causes uh, black crust uh, oxidation of the pigments, among others. And this project uh, started in um, this fantastic location that is called Villa Farnesina, where there are some incredible holes uh, frescoed by Raffaello Sanzio. You can see a, a here a lichen exposed uh, in uh, the old uh, that is called the Loggia of Amore and Psyche. And uh, this Villa Farnesina is also the headquarters of Accademia Nazionale dei Lincei, that is uh, the oldest scientific academy in Europe and associates uh, Nobel Prizes and prominent scientists. Among them, there is Antonio Scamellotti, who is really the promoter of this kind of studies. But as you can see, Villa Farnesina is facing the Lungo Tevere, and it is a very busy road. There are traffic jams uh, during both night, day and night. It's the Movida Street. And uh, so the idea was to study the diffusion of metallic particles inside the holes, uh, designing uh, a kind of something trans, uh, transect uh, from the road toward the holes. And um, uh, here is uh, the first step of this uh, study that uh, was concerning uh, tree leaves. Uh, we are um, in September 2020, mm -hmm. and we sampled uh, different lines, uh, more or less parallel lines of uh, platanus trees that are directly on the sidewalk, and then inside the gardens of the villa, uh, cypresses, uh, oleanders, uh, and myrtles, uh, which are more or less touching uh, the building itself. And um, the first uh, results were quite surprising. We were in September 2020, and uh, we found out that uh, the magnetic susceptibility of cypresses uh, was um, higher with respect uh, to platanus uh, leaves. And of course, uh, there was a decay for the other species, oleanders and myrtles. But we understood uh, the meaning of this result uh, after sampling uh, again uh, the, the same trees uh, during um, uh, December 2020. And uh, this time the magnetic susceptibility of platanus leaves uh, was more than uh, two times than uh, September, with cypresses more or less on the same range. 
And um, the cause was that uh, it was already very clear that uh, the bioaccumulation depends on the tree species. Uh, at first, the platanus uh, is not an evergreen. Cypresses, cypresses are, yes, uh, evergreen. And um, the leaves of the platanus uh, trees were exposed since uh, more or less April with only a couple of months of traffic because um, before there was the lockdown. And uh, it was uh, very evident that um, uh, despite the fact that uh, platanus is considered not a good bioaccumulator, uh, the three months were enough to double their magnetic susceptibility values. And this is a key for understanding how much uh, these retention properties provide, even when the species are not so effective, an impressive uh, preventive ecosystem service, uh, they are called in this way, with respect uh, to cultural heritage. Uh, we use uh, the lichens uh, uh, for two main reasons. At first, because they are not species independent, and so you have a biomonitor which does not depend on the species that, uh, that you consider. And then uh, because uh, this was the way for uh, going up to indoors. And uh, what we did uh, was to use uh, to tie the lichens uh, or the same uh, trees uh, that we sampled before, but also to expose uh, uh, the lichens uh, in the holes of the ground floor and of the first floor, uh, remembering that the plane of the road is more or less uh, in the middle between the two uh, floors uh, of Villa Farnesina. And um, we demonstrated uh, by means of lichens so that there was an exponential uh, decrease, as you can see, of the values of magnetic susceptibility with respect to the distance from the road. And inside uh, the holes, we can tell that at both floor, the income of magnetic particles can be considered uh, negligible. And um, uh, we believe that this effect is mainly connected uh, to the distance from the road, which is about 30 meters, uh, but also, of course, uh, to the impressive uh, cover of uh, uh, green trees uh, that are some way protecting uh, the holes from the main first input uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, emissions of dust uh, directly from the road. So moving on to the uh, so to some magnetic mineralogy, um, uh, we start with the day plot. You can see here different colors. In black, there are the samples before being transplanted. The, sorry, the, yes, the, in black, the samples before being transplanted. In green, the indoor samples. And in red, everything which is outdoors, so leaves and lichens too. And it is um, a very evident how um, the red samples, so the outdoor samples for here in the usual business as usual uh, um, side of the plot uh, where there are the known exhaust emissions uh, mainly by, uh, by breaks. And then uh, uh, moving uh, towards indoors, uh, uh, we see the shift of the properties towards, uh, well, they can be both uh, uh, finer, uh, exhaust emissions uh, or something that is connected uh, to natural sources. By fork, uh, we have another answer. It is a quite old fork uh, of uh, uh, poor bricks emissions, so directly dust, directly taken from the uh, wheels. And uh, we see that uh, the multi some multi domain components prevail. Uh, uh, for all the samples uh, that are outdoors, both lichens and leaves. But uh, also the pre-exposure sample, the lichen before being transplanted, uh, have, uh, uh, these are typical uh, pseudo-single domain vortex uh, components. And we see the same here in the lichen that was exposed in the Amor and the Psyche all. Something about trace metals, there was a very good correlation uh, between the dependent, the, uh, the concentration of the trace metal and uh, in this case, magnetic susceptibility. And um, in this case, uh, it is in very important to notice that uh, the correlation was very good with barium and antimonium, which are the typical tracers 
of uh, bricks, and there was no correlation with uh, aluminium. Uh, that is uh, a typical indicator of soil contamination. So we are talking about airborne pollution. There was no influence by soils. Uh, this uh, study was some way uh, very effective uh, for promoting these kind of studies. And then we started a lot of cooperation. I will try to show the most of them. And in this case, now we are moving uh, chronologically to the second uh, very extensive study that was concerning uh, the archaeological park of the Colosseum. It is the, uh, um, the larger archaeological side park uh, uh, in Rome. And in this case, uh, we are um, in an open space uh, and we concentrated uh, to the Via dei Cerchi side. Uh, this is Via dei Cerchi. This is called uh, the Palatino Hill. And the Via dei Cerchi separates the Palatino Hill uh, that is at about 10 meters of altitude with respect to the road uh, from this is the Circus Maximus. And uh, we sample most uh, of the Quercus silex, uh, these are in blue, uh, trees uh, on both sides uh, of the road, and uh, many different uh, species of trees uh, that are uh, there uh, over the Palatino Hill, uh, in two different areas that are uh, called the one, uh, the Pedagogium, this is the Pega Pedagogium, and this other is uh, Arcate Severiane. Uh, they are very different because the uh, pedagogium uh, is near uh, uh, to a traffic light uh, and a turn to the left, uh, while uh, here on Arcate there, there are, let's say, fast cars, so mm, no stop and no queue. Um, it was um, very evident in this case a clear dependence of the magnetic susceptibility values with the distance from the road. Uh, there are three main groups of samples that were identified uh, along the road, so here on the roadside, and there is um, a, quite a difference between uh, the two different sidewalks uh, of uh, Via de Cerchi. And then uh, these uh, uh, trees that are uh, on the edge of the hill uh, or near to the road, and then all these uh, samples that are a kind of background over the hill. Uh, at about at least uh, uh, seven, between seven and 10 meters from the border, from the edge of the Palatino Hill. Uh, I was very surprised to see for the very first time this day plot in which uh, there was no trace uh, of the typical exhaust emissions. Uh, you can see that all the points fall here in the central side of the, of the plot. And uh, for what concerns uh, the concentration levels of trace metals, uh, I can say that they were always an accumulation on the road with respect to the hill. So these are normalized for the values of the concentration levels of the samples that were taken over the hill. Um, it was very impressive uh, to see uh, the presence of some layers of surprising uh, uh, incredible surprising magnetic dark green material uh, over uh, the leaves of the Quercus silex uh, shrubs uh, or trees uh, that are directly facing on the road. I was surprised uh, to see how such incredible lysteresis loops that are probably a mixture um, due to a mixture of brakes, fuels, exhaust, asphalts and roadsides and soils. And um, we also used, uh, as usual, uh, lichens. So we decided for a direction uh, from uh, uh, Circus Maximum side of Via dei Cerchi uh, toward an indoor uh, uh, hole that is called Scola Preconum, which is slightly below the ground where there are very impressive mosaics. And also, we took uh, uh, some, we transplanted some lichens here where there is the queue and where there are the highest values for the leaves that we sampled before. And uh, as you can see, we notice uh, the typical decay of the magnetic susceptibility values. These are outdoors and these are indoor uh, in the Scola Preconum uh, with respect to the distance from the road. But we also see that. Uh, 
the two points that were taken at uh, Arcate and at uh, Scuola mm, and at uh, Pedagogium are, uh, are very high, at least at the same level of the same points on the ground. And so there seems to be not really uh, an important dependence on the altitude, but only on the longitude. So only on the distance, but not on the altitude. And um, uh, the transplants for what concerns uh, the concentration levels of the trace elements uh, told exactly the same. So as you can see from the main uh, elements, uh, barium, uh, antimonium, and so on, uh, the same decay and the same high values for what is uh, up there on the palatine over the edge. And um, for the lichens, uh, the day plot was more or less the same as we saw uh, for the leaves. But uh, fourth diagrams uh, were very good for really understanding the main difference, uh, which is not con uh, connected uh, to the altitude, so to over the palatino or uh, uh, at the um, plane of the road. But uh, the main difference is between uh, the left side, so where there is the traffic light, and uh, the right side, so uh, near the fast lane, let's call it in this way. In fact, uh, all the lichens um, and all the leaves uh, at the pedagogium side, so on the left, are dominated by this kind of, of uh, vortex components with sometimes also single domain components very evident. While on the Arcate side, so on the right, uh, you can notice a spread on the BU axis uh, telling that there is probably a component um, of uh, multi-domain particles, uh, which is not evident on the pedagogium side. This is a kind of model that, that we are uh, thinking about, uh, I think that according to what we saw also before, probably here where there is a, let's call it fast lane, the multi-domains are connected to break emission while, uh, while we are going on towards the traffic light and the turn to the left, probably. Um, the cars that are uh, in a queue and so they are emitting combustion particles without breaking anymore, are probably the single domain and vortex components connected uh, to this kind of fuse uh, and uh, no breaking. Finally, for this study, this is, uh, as usual, the connection between the uh, tracers of breaks emissions, uh, which is anyway present also uh, for both for lichens and, and leaves, uh, also in the sites that are um, in the pedagogium side. But uh, in this case, it is interesting to see the difference between the, con the correlation from with aluminium that is um, very well developed for leaves, uh, but not for lichens. I think that uh, the difference um, is on the age. These are only three months. So this is uh, probably a span of even two years because these are quercosilex leaves and probably road dust um, and uh, soil contamination is present in this case. Now, uh, uh, I told you that this is quite a long presentation. I will try to go as far as, uh, as fast as possible. This is Venice and uh, we are exposing uh, near uh, increasing distances from the canal, uh, from the Grand Canal. You can see a lichen here over uh, the studio by Picasso. We also sampled the uh, pitosporum uh, shrubs, but they were completely unusable. Uh, they are not good for biomonitoring. And um, in this case, uh, there were clearly two groups of samples. There was a statistically significant difference uh, between uh, the lichens uh, transplants that are exposed outdoors and those uh, uh, that are a single group uh, unexposed and indoors. In this case, the day plot with pseudo single domain uh, features prevailing uh, was uh, expected because, of course, uh, we have not uh, known exhaust emissions. We are in an aquatic context where bricks are not used. Um, the real meaning of this uh, study was uh, to outline the different resolution of magnetic and chemical analysis. Uh, 
there was no statistically significant uh, difference between uh, outdoor and indoor lichens according to the concentration of trace metal. Instead, this difference emerged by means of magnetic properties and was mainly linked to the iron connected to ferromagnetic properties. And uh, it was demonstrated uh, uh, calculating from the uh, saturation of magnetization by mass values, uh, understanding that we know this for magnetite, the weight percentage of magnetite in the sample, so finding uh, that uh, there are, of course, two different groups uh, of uh, magnetite presence according to the distance uh, from the canal grande. And uh, just as a curiosity, uh, we were again, uh, it was strange to see such peaks of antimonium because there are no bricks there. But this antimonium was not connected to iron, so there was no correlation with magnetic susceptibility and with uh, iron. And uh, this antimonium is due to the uh, use of antimonium uh, in the plus factories that, as you, think, as you can see, are very common in Venice. This is the last uh, study that I show you by detail. It's uh, in Buenos Aires at uh, the Museum of uh, Fine Arts and at uh, the Museum of National History. We sampled the uh, both uh, Fraxinus Americana leaves um, and uh, the famous uh, Yacaranda leaves. We also used uh, two different kinds of uh, lichens. So we brought some from Italy and we compare with uh, Argentinian uh, species. I, you can see here, it was a uh, joint to meet Marcos Chaparro, who is very involved in this bi biomonitoring studies. You can see me here placing a lichen over a Gauguin, and you can understand that probably if I was falling, uh, nobody would be interested in myself. And um, these are uh, the first uh, results. You can notice here in the two direction of the roads, the clear usual um, decay of magnetic susceptibility uh, values. Uh, in this case, they are normalized uh, as uh, uh, exposed versus unexposed. And uh, there is a clear uh, decay with respect to the road. In this case, also uh, indoors, it seems to be not such a present of ma magnetic particles. This is very good uh, for uh, cultural heritage operators. And this is the same in the other museum. And uh, by means of his method, method explained in 2021, Marcos Chamar Chaparro uh, evaluated that at outdoors the levels of uh, magnetic particles is uh, even 30 times higher than indoors. I close uh, this other um, study with uh, uh, the leaves. Yakananda is really an impressive bioaccumulator, by far better than uh, Fraxinus. And uh, here we are back at the, uh, the typical uh, day plot. You can notice that this uh, uh, shift of points from here, where there are the unexposed and indoor samples towards there, where there are instead the samples that are outdoors. Now, some, uh, I will uh, finish my presentation with uh, some uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. These are lichens exposed at Villa Farnesina. This is a lichen exposed at Villa Farnesina. This is over a Picasso. This is uh, uh, in um, at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts uh, over a Manet. And this is uh, exposed uh, uh, at the Scola Preconum at Parco Archeologico del Colosseo. We have uh, two more studies that are presently going on. Uh, this is a picture of a lichen exposed in uh, Florence at the base of the Brunelleschi Dome. Uh, we are um, trying there only with lichens because there are no trees outside. And uh, this is me at uh, the Metropolitan Museum in New York. I sampled the uh, tilia leaves. Uh, they seems to be very good by accumulator. In about one month, I will have back uh, the lichens uh, that were exposed in a direction from the Fifth Avenue towards the indoor of the Metropolitan. So I close with some methodological uh, messages, I can say. And um, 
in my opinion, in this kind of works, hysteresis in field data should be preferred with respect to remanences. I tell you this because the saturation of isothermal remanization is still one of the most uh, used parameters, but it does not take uh, into account uh, the ultrafine uh, fraction of this dust. That is, it is the most dangerous for ourselves, for our health, but also for, of course, the urban environments. Uh, by means uh, of the saturation magnetization, we can, for example, calculate the presence of iron oxides in the model of being magnetite dominant uh, um, iron oxide. Uh, so exactly knowing the weight percentage of magnetite in this sample. Uh, but there are, of course, also some methodological issues uh, in using gel caps for our hysteresis loops. Uh, I believe that we sh should verify their representativeness with respect to the use of standard HCC cubes, because, of course, inside a cup there is a, only a few material, and uh, in some cases uh, these uh, biological uh, samples are very, very weak. And so uh, we it's a good point, for example, to, go, to try to correlate the magnetic susceptibility to the uh, saturation magnetization, for example, for understanding if a, if a single gel cap uh, is some way representative of the whole sample. And uh, I close also telling you that uh, I learned a lot of statistics like working with life scientists. They are very rigorous in this, and it is not so common for ourselves as paleomagnetists. My closing uh, slide, um, I would like to tell you that magnetism can be very attractive. And uh, this kind of studies uh, was um, uh, very well followed by a lot of uh, TV news, uh, some uh, uh, documentaries and exhibitions, a lot of uh, articles in the main newspaper up to uh, articles in um, New Scientist, MIT Technology Review. So uh, I would like to tell you that magnetism can be very attractive, especially if we use it uh, some way beyond our typical application. Now I close my uh, sharing and I'm here with you. Thank you very much, Aldo. Uh, let's give Aldo a big round of applause. Oh. Uh, great talk, very, very interesting. Um, thank you very much. Thank you um, to you for inviting. It's it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Uh, there is time for questions if anybody should have some. Edward. Oh, fine. Well, I was not the first one. I think Anne Heard was the first one who raised the hand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. I apologize. No, actually, I was giving him a clap. <laughs> but uh, please be uh, not I, so in, not so formal. <laughs> but I do I do have a question. Yes, um, I mean, I don't know who is. Uh... I, no, I don't put a picture on. Okay. Because <laughs> I just oh, did, I, I just yeah, did my exercise. Oh. Yeah, this is Anne. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see you or um, to read you. <laughs> right. So my question is, um. When you're doing the hysteresis loop, how big is the diamagnetic part? So if you get the lichen before it's been exposed, the unexposed, do you see a strong diamagnetic signal? No, 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 I don't see. It's very, very rare uh, to see any diamagnetism. Um, the may, so uh, everything is in the uh, is a combination of paramagnetism and uh, uh, ferromagnetism, ferrimagnetism. And um, this uh, paramagnetism, I don't know if it's really due to, uh, okay, if you measure the magnetic susceptibility on all the, on the wall sample, you always have uh, positive values too. So there is probably some contamination, very weak contamination by uh, so it's by diamagnetism was evident only in uh, Venice because, of course, there was um, a very important impact of the love. Um, I don't know, of, um, they are some way subjected to water, of course, uh, to humidity, they are wet. And uh, even if they are dried, because I use only dried samples, I uh, 
measured only diamagnetic samples. But for the most uh, of the leaves that I measure, so Platanus leaves in Rome, Quercus ilex leaves in Rome, I don't find any diamagnetism. Okay, may I have, Amita, two short questions? Sure. Um, yeah. Yes. Aldo, thanks a lot for a nice presentation. And the first question is, do you see any significant difference between using lichens and moss? I have no experience with mosses. I don't use mosses because I work with a life scientist team who employs only uh, lichens. Also, okay. mosses can be transplanted, but they are some way less easy to be handled with respect to uh, lichens. For example, lichens are incredibly lively and um, resistant. Uh, I can receive a box of lichens uh, also after months uh, of intercontinental flights and so on, then they are in perfect shape. And this is very important for uh, using them as devices, I can tell you. Uh, I don't think it's the same for mosses because they are more or less more critical and um, some way also more complex with respect to lichens. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, if I remember well, your first set of uh, correlation plots, biplots, I think that in some cases the correlation was biased by single outliers, and I would be very careful in interpreting those plots. Uh, yes, and um, uh, the, I, I placed there only very first uh, uh, linear correlation, but of course I left uh, to life scientists uh, all the big stat statistic work okay. behind, and they can do something which I cannot do, so a lot of different statistical analysis which are of course mm, absolutely much more uh, sensitive to outliers and other kind of stuff than mine, and uh, when we published uh, this work, uh, Everything was under rigorous <laughs> uh, control by life scientists and also by test of outliers and so on. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thanks, Aldo. Um, is there any other question? You can also write it in the chat if you cannot... Uh... If there is no one, I have a short comment, very small sure. comment. Being, Go ahead, Edward. Being a and then Mario. Being a physicist, I am sensitive when you put on one of the first slides uh, that paramagnetic and diamagnetic curves are hysteresis loops. There are no hysteresis. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, of course. Uh, this is a typical workflow that I show to people uh, in the, okay, cultural heritage operators and life scientists are the main part of this kind of presentation. And I have to show I them know, that know, there is know. a sensitive difference between what I saw, see if there is no hysteresis loops and if I see if there is hysteresis loop. And so I show them that there is a linear behavior when you don't they have just them. say linear behavior. Yeah, and the butter uh, they have to see something. As of course I have to see something when they show me statistics and life science and so on. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. And now Mario. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for your presentation, Aldo. It was very interesting. Well, my, my question, it, it's maybe two questions in the same, because maybe they are related. Uh, I remark that uh, um, when you show your Dunlop diagrams, um, well, I think it was expected that that the particles that were emitted by combustion should have a more single domain characteristic because they correspond to fast cooling. So it is probably that they should have uh, uh, were more small particles with a, a single domain more more characteristic, and they, and they are not. They are in the pseudo single domain and so on. But also, in the, I'm sorry for making these two questions in the same part because maybe they are related. I remark also that in your plots of uh, correlation of uh, magnetic susceptibility and metals, 
and the, in your plots and in plots that we have for the work that we have begun begin here in Lisbon, uh, we have a poor correlation. Uh, I think it's not great correlation. It's a poor correlation with iron, but we have a very nice correlation sometimes with the antimony or copper or zinc. So my point is if uh, the particles are, and I think that from the IRM curves and so on, we see that these particles are mainly uh, titanomagnetite, titanium pur, so with the uh, magnetite. Um, why the signal of the iron is so weak and why we don't have more uh, single domain or more close to single domain particles, these particles from the combustion? Okay, uh, this is quite a complex uh, question and I will try to answer about iron. This is a key point. I often have no correlation with iron and there was no correlation in Venice too. But there was correlation uh, if we share the samples into two groups, uh, the outdoor and the indoor and unexposed and unexposed. That's why in this case the iron related to the anthropic activities was ferrimagnetic. Iron is everywhere, but not all the iron is ferrimagnetic or is related to ferrimagnetic minerals. With uh, hysteresis loops, you can share what is the iron, which is the iron in connection to anthropic uh, activities, which is ferrimagnetic, and the iron uh, that is in the environment, in the clays, in everything which is not ferrimagnetic. Uh, this is why, for example, I prefer to use uh, hysteresis loops, for example, uh, the saturation of magnetization, because it is really related only to the ferrimagnetic part uh, of this. Instead, antimonium, for example, is related to anthropic emission, and so it is related to the ferrimagnetic uh, emissions. And this is why it is very well connected with magnetic properties. So the problem with chemistry, and this is why in Venice, for example, the, 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 there was no correlation and um, it was not possible to see the difference between outdoors and, is, and indoors, is that you see that there is a certain amount of iron, but you don't know the source. And in this case, only a very small part of this iron is connected to anthropic activities, but this is what we need. About the grain size, uh, in my opinion, uh, this kind of analysis uh, work very better for non-exhaust emission than exhaust emissions, because it is very much easier to discriminate uh, non-exhaust emissions uh, with respect uh, to the group of uh, uh, combustion particles, soils, uh, and so on. Uh, you have seen, for example, that in the case of Villa Farnesina, the pseudo single domain range was not due to, uh, uh, to fuels, uh, which fall in the very same area of the same particles that are uh, natural sources and before being uh, transplanted, uh, the lichens. Uh, so it is not so easy sometimes to really understand the, the, the behavior of the um, exhaust emissions because they can be also related to, for example, road dust and so on. But the pseudo single domain range can also depend on the combination of, uh, let's say, single domain particles from exhaust emissions and multi-domain particles for, uh, uh, from breaks. So when, for example, you are in the typical moderate uh, anthropic context, so when there are not so buzzy streets, uh, you are in this middle range area that depends on the combination of multi-domain uh, uh, multi fraction with uh, due to the exhaust emission and uh, 
uh, the non the exhaust emissions that are due to fluids. Okay. Okay. But I think Thank also you, that there is a lot of work to do for the end members. We should go on uh, uh, with the intercalibration of our results. And one of the main things is to un really understand, to have a, really an, an archive, a database of the exhaust and non-exhaust emission. Because uh, our database is really poor. Uh, we have only a few examples and some interesting papers. Some are just uh, now in publication pro progress, but we have to go on with the so-called members, in my opinion. Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you to you. OK, thank you. Uh, is there any other question from from the audience? If there is no other question, uh, thanks again, Aldo, for giving the very interesting talk. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank, um, you, I'm gonna, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to share the last slide. So we're going to have next week is going to be Deepa presenting and in April is Kate Bristol and then we're going to have a break for EJU. But we have still slots available for June to August where we're going to move to uh, Eastern Hemisphere friendly times. If you missed this uh, seminar, if you want to watch uh, the previous ones, you can uh, go to our YouTube, YouTube channels and um, if you are interested in knowing more about the next magnets, if you are just watching the video, you can sign up to a mailing list. You can write to me. Um, and uh, thanks again to all for coming, to all our past speakers. And we look forward to uh, 24 full of uh, very interesting science and talks. Thank you very much. <laughs>